Welcome to Five Steps to an Abundant Future. I'm Matt Powers. Let's start this webinar with some quotes to get our mindset in the right place. So first off, this is a quote from Charles Eisenstein's The More Beautiful World. This narrative of normal is crumbling on a systemic level. Our systems of money, politics, energy, medicine, education, and more are no longer delivering the benefits they once did or seem to. Their utopian promise, so inspiring a century ago, recedes further every year. Millions of us know this more and more. We hardly bother to pretend otherwise. Yet, we seem helpless to change, helpless even to stop participating in the industrial civilization's rush over the cliff. Kind of resonates with a lot of people today, doesn't it? That's the story, right? The, the story we were raised on doesn't, you know, resonate at all anymore. It's not real. It's not true. We know so much more, but we don't know where we're going. And we just sit in the old story. Charles Eisenstein's work's incredible. Check it out if you get a chance. This is my frame with, with which I would love us to look at and look through, okay? Behaviorally challenging kids are challenging because they're lacking the skills to not be challenging. And this is Ross Green, the explosive child, a new approach for understanding and parenting easily frustrated, chronically inflexible children. And as an educator, you know, Ross's concept of kids succeed when they can really has guided me and unlocked myself, my teaching, and some students who were inflexible. And it has unlocked a ton of conversations, really, actually. When I understand that that audience member or that person doesn't understand because they don't have the skills, I can break things down, scaffold down to where they're at and give them that skill or that piece of understanding that they need. So, and that's the same in my classroom, that's the same with everything in life for ourselves included. You don't get something, there's a pathway through, through to get that understanding. So I want us to start with that frame, especially when we look at politics nowadays, right? They're like, oh, they just don't get it, you know? It's like, yeah, they lack the skills to not be challenging, to not be difficult, to not be, you know, contrary. <laughs> so let's begin with, uh, who am I? I mean, this guy in front of this camera talking to you right now, but who am I really? Well, I started off as a musician. I, I played in bands in New York City. I played with people like this. I jammed with people like ZZ Top's Billy Gibbons. I met my wife. Everything changed. My values changed. We started our family. But early on, as we started our family, my, my path changed because my wife got cancer. She got cancer actually three times. The first time she got it, it was like a serious blow. It changed everything. But then three months later after the radiation, she got cancer again. That's when like everything really changed. When I got serious, when all the fluff just like boom, was gone from my life. And I'm like, what is going on here? Why are you getting cancer, melanoma, where the sun doesn't hit you? right after we did the radiation, which is like supposedly to fight cancer. And then I'm like researching that these things can cause cancer. I asked the doctors point blank. They can't meet my eyes. They say that can't be possible. They're all uncomfortable. And then I don't trust doctors. And then I go into research like at the next level. It changes me, makes me want to know exactly what's, what, what's going on. And I need to know, I need to completely understand this. And it also sent me on a mission to try to figure out how to prevent the cancer from coming back a third time. And it did come back a third time. And then it became my mission to you know, make sure it didn't come back a fourth time. And so what I realized was, um, first of all, I had to get out of the patterns and what we were doing. And so we left the East Coast. I quit my job playing music for Rachel Ray's husband, John Cusimano in The Cringe. I played with them for seven years. SNL's house drummer, like for over almost 20 years now. 
he he was in that band with this amazing amazing musician these people were like my mentors in the music industry and 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 you know i weighed like 40 pounds more because i was eating so much most of the people on the tour with us were italian every night we're eating tons of food and having a good time you know but my wife wasn't with us my wife instead was suffering and so i could no longer enjoy myself I had to do something else and i moved to the west coast I did music a little while longer in LA, but I became a school teacher so that I could be at home, so that I could be close to my wife and children, help out, so that I had the time and the freedom to do the things that I wanted to do. And I was like a quirky English teacher. I, I, I taught, you know, seed saving, I taught cooking, I taught permaculture, we had a garden, and I got hooked on seeds and I realized, you know, the one thing I could control was our diet. And so we bought all organic. We, we took that plunge and then we ran out of money. <laughs> I was just a school teacher, you know, in a really poor county in California. It was the sixth most violent county in California actually too. And so um, it, was, it was very interesting because I was able to teach without homework. And well, that's a separate story, but I got hooked on seeds. I got hooked on teaching too, but I got hooked on seeds and I got really good at gardening. And then like I got stuck fighting the animals, the ground squirrels, the deer, and it drove me and the, and the rabbits. I forgot about the rabbits. Yeah, yeah, it, it was bad. Every creature seemed to have it out for me. And I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand that my system itself was crying out in stress to be removed, composted, and returned as soil, um, or manure, then soil. And so I didn't understand this until I studied permaculture. And when I studied permaculture, it unlocked so much for me that I was able within a few, only a few months to grow tons of soil, to have my soil that was like small and thin and, and like the like, light tannish color, you know, almost whitish to, to ch like you, you put your shoulder deep into it, you know, and you, you're still going down. It's the same dark chocolate color all the way down. I had generational farmers coming over to my home, you know, people who have lived in the area I taught their grandchildren and they're digging up soil in my, in my berms and my swales being like, what is this? And it was because I applied simple permaculture principles and techniques. And they're not things that are secret. They're things that I could have, you know, picked up anywhere and put together. But until I saw it in a holistic system, I couldn't understand what was going on in my system. I mean, you know, later on, I'll, t I'll show you w w what's going on, but my soils were intense. So I got to that next level with permaculture. It was really the only way that I could compete with the heat, with the animals. And no one else was doing this except spending a lot of money, spending a lot of inputs, spending a lot of, of water. And so I even dry farmed in this region, 140 degree soils, made it happen. And then I wrote a book, The Permaculture Student One, and I, and, and I wrote it because I realized during my PDC with Jeff Lawton, there was nothing for kids. There was nothing for my son to use to start designing and start learning permaculture. I would have to like teach him just verbally. And I was like, no, I'm gonna create curriculum because it doesn't exist. And, and no one, I, I couldn't find it anywhere. And that's why I asked Jeff, you know, will you help me? Will you check it over and make sure I'm right? You know, and he said, yeah. And so that's why I did it. And what happened was very quickly, you know, it exploded. I asked for $9,000. I got 26000 in, you know, the, t the 30 days that I was allotted. It was an absolute miracle. And I was able to quit that job and just work exclusively on this. And so... I, it exploded. I turned into this online course. My books went all over the world. They started being translated into other languages. And then I did another Kickstarter for the Permaculture Student 2. And this book went even deeper. It actually updated permaculture as we know it. 
what happened was no one had done a generalist permaculture book since Bill Mollison that was cited. All the other things are bioregional. They're about their own little region and their own little experience using permaculture learned from Bill Mollison. But no one had done a global generalist text s since Bill. So I did the global generalist introduction and then I did the global generalist advanced textbook. The first textbook designed for high school and college as well. And so it was also the first permaculture textbook ever that was peer reviewed. So we have this very incredibly unique situation where I was able to be a teacher, to see the need, to get the education, and then to work with experts one-on-one -on -one, because this was peer reviewed and peer edited. So peer reviewed is post after it's already been written, right? And they give it a review and they send you back. I, I actually worked with them in a conversation as I was writing it. So they were teaching me and I was growing and showing them and getting feedback and developing it. So in a lot of ways, I'm just like the students learning, you know, the material in my book. I just learned it with, you know, my professional lens with a professional so that we could articulate the learning process in such a way that it was like really powerful. And people are, I mean, realizing it and noticing it and freaking out about it. And that's why um, I've sold so many copies. That's why uh, people are talking about it everywhere. Uh, that's why the reviews are so amazing um, for it. And, you know, I urge you to check out this book and we'll talk more about it later in the webinar. So these are some of the peer reviewers who helped me uh, create that incredible book. And so I basically wrote it and then I would get feedback from them and then write it and then get more feedback. And then it was this constant feedback. And sometimes the feedback was so good that I just quoted it <laughs> and cited it as from the, that email series. So yeah, it was really an incredible process. And then I've written other books for kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, I've done live uh, Q&A consecutive like every day for weeks on end for Baker Creek. Uh, heirloom ex uh, they're the heirloom expo people and then I've also done tons of speaking you know engagements all over America not really the East Coast I haven't gone back east I've done the Midwest and the West really and I've been doing this for the past two and a half years and I've even worked with the World Beat Cultural Center in Balboa Park to uh, help them with their gardens there and their education and so I've just been around doing these kinds of things and you're probably wondering though, what is permaculture to you? Because everyone's got their definition of permaculture, it seems. Um, but for me, I always go back to the original documents, you know, I go back to the original sources because I mean, you know, I was an English major, an academic, and uh, you know, a Shakespeare colloquium guy, you know? So I want the original originals, you know, I wanna know where this stuff comes from. So what is permaculture, really? Well, it really, the term really just derived from permanent agriculture, tree crops, J. Russell Smith, but then it got adapted into this concept of permanent culture. This was part of all of our longest running like cultures and on earth. So, so this is not something new. This is something they created a concept around to uh, like to highlight in these cultures so we could recognize it and promote it and enhance it. So Bill Mollison was a university professor who was working on a theory for everything. And one of his students was a young, and he was like way younger than all his classmates. So I think he was 17 or 18 and he was writing his thesis to graduate from college. And a very young David Holmgren was there. And together they came up with this concept in a conversational way about you know how to establish a permanent culture. Uh, and so they started looking at food, agriculture, housing, social structures, all these different things to, and then they, they were studying the longest lasting cultures, indigenous cultures, and they were deriving these ethics and then principles. And then they were gonna build out from there, combining all the different indigenous wisdom and then current insights from science. So that's originally where it really began. And the ethics, the language of them has changed as cultures have come in contact with it. 
Originally, it was Earth Care, Human Care, and Return of Surplus. And a lot of people feel like that was like way too economic. And young children don't really understand, you know, how this all worked when you just use Return of Surplus. It at one point became Fair Share in David Holmgren's book. And the thing is, he was simplifying everything and breaking everything down so that it would be really easy to understand. He was using rhyme, you know, fair share, people care, earth care. He was creating it so that it was mnemonically more pleasing. But in America, fair share sounds socialist to a lot of like right wingers. So it created this whole other political connotation. And then more recently, well, I was wading through this mire of politics, economics, ver like everyone arguing about this, being like, whoa, this is too capitalistic. Oh, this is too socialistic. You know, people arguing about that regularly on Facebook. I arrived upon this, this concept someone shared with me, this idea of care of the future and how it's this indigenous concept. You know, it's like the seven generations in the future, care of the future. And so I think it works way better. And that's why I've adopted that into my own, my own representation of what permaculture is. So earth care, people care, care of future equals permaculture when those things overlap. So principles, what kind of principles are we talking about? Well, if we're talking about Bill's principles, we're talking about five principles and all the other principles in his book, he has tons, aren't his. They're just other principles from other things that he brought in. So work with nature, the problem is the solution, make the least change for maximum effect, the yield of a system is theoretically unlimited, and then everything gardens. Notice that Holmgren, he's got these like 12 principles. He's got fair share, he's got produce no waste. Um, the, the reality is that, you know, the waste is part of a cycle, and some people consider any waste in a cycle to be a gift to the next cycle. And there's always waste in a cycle. So the term waste and produce no waste, the concept creates this whole semantic argument with a lot of these people nitpick and pull apart. And, and so, you know, obtain a yield. It's like, well, sometimes it's a return of surplus. So it's, you're not getting yield, you know, and they get all caught up in that. And so I don't, I, I don't like a lot, a lot of the simplifications. Instead, I try to create language that's much more precise and says what it actually means. And I have, you know, over 20 principles in my book. I have social principles, which, which those books don't. Um, but what I realized in the course of diving deeper and making this large book and doing this and courses is that, you know, it was too complicated. It was too complex, long story, you know. Um, if, if we're gonna reach people in that elevator conversation, if we're gonna reach people, you know, our neighbors, people that were just explaining what we're doing, why are you doing this? Well, I'm doing this thing for a permaculture, a cult? You know what I mean? They're not gonna understand. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, well, I'm doing this thing with perennials and, and there's gonna be water catchment and it's oriented toward the sun. They're like, wow, this is complicated. I'm never gonna understand this, you're amazing. And so they, they, they take it a bunch of different ways, but it's never quite where they're like, oh, I wanna do this too. Yeah, I'm gonna do it right now. Come on, let's go. You know, it's never quite like that. Sometimes it is. Sometimes people are just natural teachers and explain it just right. Um, but most of us need things broken down. So what is this conversation? What, is, what really needs to happen? Well, for me, it, it, it breaks down into five simple steps build soil, grow forests, restore the oceans and all water, regenerate biodiversity and rewild human culture to support those four other steps. And this will guarantee an abundant future. Now let's dive in and see why. So step one, build soils. So have you heard that we're losing our soils, our topsoil at like a rapid rate? Have you heard of the dead zone? That the Mississippi, all the soils flow off Iowa and go down and Mississippi and then create this huge dead zone while the fertilizers and soil, the excess carbon and nitrogen kills everything. And that once beautiful fisheries are now just stinky, dead, anaerobic sites. I mean, this, this you probably already know. Um, Time Magazine, you know, pretty middle of the road, 
they're asking, is the soil going to run out? Because they're saying there's 60 years left of topsoil, which means that, you know, there's 55 because that was a few years ago. So, and it's caused by farming methods that strip the soil of carbon. We know about this carbon rise, right? We know about the atmospheric carbon parts per million that everyone's worried about. We know it's significantly risen higher than it ever has um, in human, human times. We also know that low levels of organic matter in the soil are an issue. The reality is, is that carbon is organic matter. Let me say that again. The carbon in the atmosphere that we need to draw down, when we bring it down into the soil, we bring it down in the form of organic matter. So that means all the yard clippings, all the leaves, everything that we clean up, could potentially be composted and then turn into exactly the carbon that we're losing in the, in the atmosphere. So when people are burning their yard waste, they are literally, unless they're doing the Bukashi method or the you know, maybe conservation method, um, they are burning that carbon into the atmosphere and contributing to climate change. And they're taking that carbon that just grew out of the ground and partnered and was pulled out of the air and the nitrogen possibly to make the protein in it is pulled out of the air and they're burning and returning it to the air. And then they're getting into their vehicles. They're running fossil fuels. It's fossilized organic matter that they're burning. So at some point we got to return, you know, like like the debt we owe to the soil and it's only through organic matter that we can do that this is the carbon cycle we all should have been taught in schools but we weren't what's going on with the ocean acidification is there's just basic diffusion we have you know so much in the atmosphere that's diffused into the ocean and that's why there's excess carbon also in the ocean it's also flowing in through the rivers and you get the actual soil sediment, right? So the only ways, as you can see from this chart, is it's returning through life. And yes, the ocean takes it in five to 10 times the amount that land-based systems do, but we still need to take it in through life and then sequester it in the soil, whether it's the ocean soils or it's the land soils. We need to take it in. And you know, if you want to make biochar, great, that's wonderful. Do it in a way that it doesn't release anything and then we can put it back to the soil. That's what we need. So you're like, well, how fast is this going to take? I mean, how, I mean, how much carbon are we talking about? Well, the wonderful Dr. Rattan Lal, which I will be speaking with soon. I'm, I'm so excited about this. He did this, this amazing paper and in it, I'll quote, the net primary productivity NPP of a, of a field corn is 400 times more than the annual increase in atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide at the rates of two parts per million per year. So basically what's going on at the rate that, that when this was written in 2010, it was two parts per million per year, right? Um, at that rate, the corn is sequestering 400 times the amount of carbon that's released. So in other words, all these fields of corn that are this huge problem because we're spraying them, if we turn them into organic, no-till, regenerative fields of corn, and then all that biomass, after you harvested the corn, returned to the soil, and we used compost teas, and maybe EM and Bokashi and, and maybe some Korean natural farming. And we went all crazy with all the regenerative patterns and solutions, came up with the, the burly, no, best of the best combinations. We're gonna see some incredible things happen. So we have so much potential to turn this ship around. You're like, it's a big ship, how are we gonna turn it around? It's like agriculture on the earth is a giant ship that if we influence, we can just 
not even talking about dealing with the desertified lands or the degraded lands that we already abandoned. That's a separate huge carbon potential for sequestration, Car carbon sequestration potential. So corn is a C4 grass. You might've heard that before. So is sorghum, so is sugarcane. We have to keep in mind that these plants that we have around us have superpowers that we're blunting or denying or short circuiting instead of enhancing, encouraging, you know, increasing, highlighting. All right, so this is from priority one. This is from 2005. So keep in mind that the numbers exponentially change and, and increase, you know, uh, but it's really insightful to see that if you took all the carbon in the atmosphere that we need to bring down, and then when we measure carbon, we burn the organic matter and the soot that's left over is how we measure it, okay? It's what we do with the soil test. So if we just reverse that, <laughs> we just have the carbon dioxide be soot. It actually only comes out to 2.1 millimeters thick on all agricultural land. Not all land, just agricultural land. So we know of people using wood ash and all this stuff to, 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 to amend soils. So conceivably, it's not that much. We just have to pull it out, not just cut trees and burn it and put it in the ground. We have to pull it out of the atmosphere. Well, corn seems to do a pretty good job of that, doesn't it? So if we just start partnering with these things, we'll see an incredible, incredible change. Um, so yeah, this comes to th like, you know, 5% organic matter increase. And if you're talking about the soils in America, huh, that's four to five times minimum that we could increase it easily. So we could sequester all the atmospheric excess of carbon within only a few seasons. And then there'd be more room. So not only will we heal the atmosphere from the industrial revolution, we could heal it from the past 10,000 years of, de of degradation. And so we could talk more about what that would do, but let's keep going on to all the different levers that we can pull in our system that are gonna make this unbelievable change happen. So the food soil, the soil food web, ah, I always say the food soil web, the soil food web was really shown to us and highlighted by Dr. Elaine Ingham. Her PhD was creating an easy, simple, fail-safe test to showcase the populations of the soil food web. And she did it. That's why she's a doctor. And that's why she's, you know, the compost queen. She's teaching us about compost at such a high level. She's changing landscapes with just soil life. Her methodologies are how almost all of these other higher level, more specific kind of disciplines with soil are occurring. They're using her methodologies in new ways. So when you talk to Chris Trump about soil life, he knows exactly what to say because he's trained both by Elaine Ingham and he's also trained at a university. And he also grew up on that farm. And then he also studied Korean natural farming from one of the masters. So his understanding comes in that language, comes through that lens. And this soil food web that we're talking about is really, really incredible because if you partner with it, you can grow two to three feet of soil a year. You can sequester six tons of carbon. And as you can see, there's a lot of interactions that can happen. This picture right here actually features the most arrows out of any other picture and they're all cited. So <laughs> we have to embrace the complexity. We have to partner with life. We can't just keep spraying, can't use salt fertilizers. We can't kill our soil. We have to make it a living, happy thing. There are characters that are major players in the soil food web. And one of them is AM fungi or arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, arbor, right, like tree. The, the, in the microscope, the shape it takes as it enters the cell is like a tree. So it's responsible for a third of all carbon sequestered in our soils. 
globally in the form of soil structure. The carbon glues that hold the soil together and give it its loamy texture. In the northern temperate zones, it can account for 47% of the carbon in the soil. And this is from my, my, my book, Five Steps to an Abundant Future. This is actually incredible. This one fungi, which I could go on and on and on about, because I know AMF and AMF defies so many things that we think are in our, in our in the way we've taught ourselves, the way we've established science and life that we, as we know it, AMF defies. So AMF is incredible. I can just keep going on about it. But this one fungi show up for a few days to a couple weeks and completely change the soil. You know, pull carbon out, be trading, creating this relationship with, so, with, the, with the roots, and then it's gone. And so it's an incredibly mysterious, cool fungi, but it's critical to life as we know it on this planet. And, you know, it, it's a humble, you know, ephemeral thing. And so understanding that this is just one of the major players is so critical when you when you start diving deeper into this. So organic no-till, low-till and no-kill farming equals compost. And so that our muscular mycorrhizal fungi, if you're constantly spraying, constantly tilling, you know, it really can't do its job properly because you're constantly releasing all that carbon even if it shows up. And I mean, you might have a toxic field, you're praying Roundup, and an AMF doesn't even show up. So there's so much going into this. That simple, humble compost comes to the rescue by giving you an inoculation of both organic matter, carbon, and then food for, for the soil life, and then all the proper soil life so that your garden or your farm or your ranch gives you amazing products, gives you trustworthy products, reliable products, and products that make the world a better place, make your life better, make your body, your family, and your customers' bodies better. Do you know why we don't till? This chart explains it really well. When we till, we make it more bacterial dominant by chopping up all the fungi. And then when it's more bacterial dominant, it's perfect for weeds. And it's also where nitrates are. And those nitrates feed the weeds. So when, when it's bacterial dominant, the waste from the bacteria and fungi that are present is all nitrate, which feeds the weeds, plants, grasses, and things like that. And then as we move further into non-disturbed soils, they get more acidic because it becomes more fungal dominant and the byproduct is mostly ammonium. But the trick here is when we constantly are tilling and tilling and tilling, it just can never get out of the weeds because the soil has no structure. The soil has no glues from the fungi, which give it its loamy structure like we just talked about. So if you want a beautiful garden, a beautiful farm, beautiful soil, you want fungi. And if you're tilling, you're favoring bacterial dominant conditions. And so you're losing soil structure. As you till, it sends that carbon, it gets oxidized, soil life gets oxidized, and all that gets released in the atmosphere. If you ever cut soil and then smelled it, there's a distinct smell that's being released from the soil. You're smelling things that are being released. So we have to keep this in mind. This is also the succession of, of plants. As you move to the right and go down to more acidic, suddenly you're in the forest. Suddenly you're in the evergreens. So you move more towards the weeds and the brassicas. Where are you? You're at the edges of disturbed zones. You're at the edge of the beach, you know, the edge of the desert. So that's, that's what's going on here is there's this huge secession between plants, between bacteria and fungi, and it's incredible to learn more about. So we need to evolve from an annual-based diet to a perennial-based diet if we want an abundant future. And that's because that, that no-till that we just talked about, if we want it to be fungal dominant, if we want it to be sequestering carbon in large amounts, then we need to be perennials, not annuals. So we need to embrace a completely new way of eating in a lot of ways. We need to embrace a new you know, forms of food, more local, perennial, 
native foods and they're there and waiting for us and they're delightful and good too and they'll be healthier for us and yeah sean sherman the sous chef will teach you all about that all right so step two <laughs> grow forests once upon a time the earth was covered with forests primeval forests and north america was no different and even in the 1600s where uh, america was like the new world right even then that forest had been greatly diminished by the indigenous people using fire to create grazing land in the Midwest for their cattle, which were the buffalo. And then as time went on into the 1900s, we removed basically all the forests from America and almost everything we have is secondary growth. And currently, a lot of the leftover old growth is dying uh, because the largest trees in the world are all sick. And that's because of climate change. So, volcano hunters dig into Sahara's watery past. So, the thing with the Sahara is it once was an amazing savanna. It was one of the most life-rich places on Earth. And savannas always are. And where did all those animals come from for the Romans to kill in the Colosseum? Oh, that's right. It was North Africa. And then, where did all the, you know, the food you know, all the people, the slaves. Oh yeah, it's North Africa. So we, we killed the animals and just like Alan Savory shows with his work, you remove the animals from a savanna landscape and you destroy the savanna landscape. So not only were the Romans, you know, assaulting the earth in a bunch of places, but they're removing all the animals and all the people that were tending the land with their behaviors, their indigenous cultures. And so, they disturbed all these different cycles and they basically created the situation that we currently see that is now the Sahara Desert. And we can reverse it. We can bring back the savanna. It will take time and effort, but it can be done. Heard of nano clay yet? Yeah, it's going to be awesome. So we need to revegetate. We need to bring things back. We need to start rewilding. What does rewild mean? To have a system that runs itself without human intervention or input. That's the ideal. Constantly sequestering carbon, constantly generating more life, constantly creating more clean water and clean air. That's the earth that I want to live on, that I want my children to inherit. And if anyone out there thinks that, you don't know that, that oh, the economy comes before that, it doesn't matter what kind of systems that we aspire to or that we're tempted by or that we're, you know, all this stuff that's human is an overlay over the reality that is the natural world and the limitations thereof. So unless we start caring for the future, we start creating wild systems that increasingly get better, that don't require human intervention, we will not have a future that we want our children to inherit. So. I am not going to settle for anything less than an abundant future. And I hope that you feel that way, okay? <laughs> because we need to make this happen now. All right, I'm gonna keep going. But so to just show you what's possible and why I feel this way and why I want this, think about the people of the Les Plateau. It was so degraded there the people were starving in the 60s and 70s and they felt like their children and their children's children would continue to starve and life would get continuously worse. The Los Plateau is the area where the silt comes that makes the Yellow River yellow. And that silt is the reason they constantly have to put up the dikes or else the river moves and kills millions of people. These dikes are way above people's houses, tree lines, all this stuff. So when it floods, it floods 20 to 30 feet high. Last time it moved, it killed millions of people. And it happens usually every time the government changes over in China. So when the government doesn't do its job, doesn't man the dikes to the Yellow River, it gets called China's Sorrow, the other name of the Yellow River. So it was historically degraded by the start of agriculture. The Han Dynasty, the dominant ethnic group of China, started in the, in the Los Plateau. They based all the dynasties there until the farming ran out and then they did grazing there. They moved the capital somewhere else. They continued until it was done. And then the erosion is massive. 
or used to be. And they reversed this in only nine years. And this is the problem. The dust from the Los Plateau is so bad that people in Northern China's islets would go straight down. They're adapted to this environmental problem and they reversed it in nine years. Their bodies have phenotypically reacted to the environment that has been created by their ancestors actions and in not just one generation, nine years, less than a decade, they reversed this problem. It cannot be emphasized enough. And so they did it themselves and they created these terraces and they planted perennials and they've been harvesting water, stopping erosion, and they became so productive. And you can go to Google Earth and, and fly over and see all this. They're so productive that all the provinces around them said, we want to do this. This is incredible. And so they changed Chinese law to allow for, and this is, the, let's actually, let me start at the beginning. So here are the numbers. So start off as 35,000 square kilometers. And then it, that's the size of Belgium. And then it ballooned into 50,000 square kilometers. And then when they changed Chinese law to allow all the other provinces to do this, it turned into 500,000 square kilometers. And they made it so that all rural China, if it's 20% or steeper, must be in permanent vegetation. Changes everything. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible what they did and the amount of carbon they sequestered is monumental. So Neil Speckman in Saudi Arabia has been doing this as well in an area with much less rain, much less erosion, just violent, violent um, water, water events when they do arrive. He's managed to slow the water down, slow it, soak it, and then use it very, very carefully. And so he has a well that fills up with the rain and he measures how much came into the ground and he always makes sure he uses less than he got and he was drip lines directly on the trees. And so within three years, he went from this barren soil to this. Look at that. He, there's no bare soil in his swales. It's absolutely incredible. And a lot of this didn't get any water. He's been, he's been experimenting with areas that don't, he's not watering at all. So he has some places under the drip line, some places that have nothing. And it's truly incredible what's possible with plants. So step three, restore the oceans and waterways. We need to liberate the water. We need to take those concrete barriers that we've created that we're losing the water around with and that's heating up and it's baking the water out. We need to get rid of that. We need to slow the water down. We need to have it meander. We need to have floodplains again in wetlands to filter that water. The more edge there is, the more life there is. So we want to bring as much wiggle and waggle into our waterways as possible. Meander, as they say. And so when we do that, we allow life to return. We allow plants and animals to return. And it, and it really purifies the water and enhances all the storages for the nutrients that were in that water, for the, the water itself. It gets stored in the banks, gets stored in the landscape. It's really incredible. Now, this is totally unpopular, I'm sure, but it's a reality that we kind of all know. We have to have a ban on almost all ocean harvesting. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we need to stop eating fish, sharks, all the large animals, whales, all of that. We can eat the stuff that's sequestering carbon and trapping the nitrogen that's coming off, that's the extra you know, nutrients. We have to fight the eutrophication by bringing that excess carbon and nitrogen back on land. And we can eat it and then put to sequester that and cart, you know, and we could compost our manure and return it to soil. That's fine. But it's biological sequestration and filtration that we need to happen right now. So those fish, they're accumulating all the toxins, and that's why the fish are toxic, right? And everyone's like, we've lost so much of their fish. It's a desert in the ocean right now, the people are saying. And so this biological sequestration and filtration can't happen. 
So we got all these toxins in the ocean, got all this excess nitrogen and carbon, and then we're removing all the life. They're the things that filter all that stuff out and sequester it, clean the water. So we need to bring them and ramp them up if we want to have clean fish in 12 years. We might have to all take a break to get even better fish, even better food a few years from now. White tuna in New York City isn't white tuna. In fact, they were toxic fish. So people eating sushi and like, oh, I got the seat, cheap sushi. <laughs> it's like, yeah, do you even know what that is that you're eating? You don't probably. And the people there buy it and says that on the package. How are they supposed to know? But everyone kind of knows. Everyone kind of knows that, you know, tuna's on the way out. They really read the articles. But the articles didn't do anything. So they stopped coming. So we're at this point where we need to stop harvesting from the ocean, except for things that we can bring back on land, like kelp. And you're like, oh, but wait, but you're harvesting that kelp. And we're trimming the kelp. And we're only trimming things that are fully sequestered with carbon. So you take it out. It's got the nitrogen in it too. That's what the protein is. And then they bring it on land and they put it back into the soil. And the reality is we're, bringing, we're, we're just bringing the minerals that were lost from the land back. So we, this is a perfect loop. This is a perfect system. And it's also, it's, 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 it's ancient. I mean, people are bringing in seaweed. The Irish were doing this and back onto their fields for a very long time. All right, so something that people are doing um, in an attempt to, to be regenerative, um, but it's not quite there, uh, is this example. So the kelp is lined, it's not actually perennial, or it, that, so they take the whole kelp, they don't actually have it more, they're not actually developing a kelp for us. The, the, uh, the mussel socks are good, but the oyster cages and some of these other cages, we gotta have on the inlets of the water so we filter it as it comes into the system. The actual forest needs to stay put, it needs to be rooted in the ground, it needs to be there, you know, it needs to be like a natural windbreak. We need to rewild the coasts. So not just in the water. We need to go up into the land, and rewild it there, and then we need to go to the inlets to there, and all the water that leads to there, the wetlands, we need to rewild those so that it's these zones that go in and outward that protect this area. A wonderful example of, of this is Veta La Palma. And this is in Europe, and it, it's really an amazing example. If you want to watch a talk, a TED talk on this place, it's called How I Fell in Love with a Fish, Dan Barber. And it's really, really amazing. It's one of the largest bird sanctuaries in Europe. Wasn't intended to be that. It's a fish farm. They've reflooded a drained wetland, brought back all the fish, brought back all the, you know, the shrimp, the algae, the birds, and they just harvest like they're predators. They don't take too much. They don't clear it. They just take just enough and they keep it a thriving ecosystem. And that's their key to success. So going with these zones, going further out to the sea, we have artificial reefs. We need these because they act like barrier reefs. Ugh. They act like windbreak does, where they compress the airways, except they compress the ocean waves. And then they are only higher up, and then they hit that, that kelp forest, and it breaks it up even more, making for um, like all these little sanctuary areas that are still and calm for life to generate. And that's gonna be really important to so much of the sea life that we're trying to regenerate, that we're trying to support. All right, so step four, support and generate biodiversity. Did you guys see this picture from National Geographic? This is where you have all this diversity that the seed houses had, and in the 80s it went down to like nothing. And this is why in the 90s and the aughts, you had people like, Jared Gettle from Baker Creek. You have people like the Seed Savers Exchange, people like Territorial Seeds, Battleful Gardens, all start up and start selling heirlooms to fill this huge gap that opened up. And thankfully they did so that we could all enjoy so many new varieties that are really just old varieties that got lost. Unless you're talking about Brad Gates's work, right? We'll get to that. So seed saving. Seed saving is really critical to this because you can participate in it, you can enhance this, and you can keep this going. Uh, plant breeding, making your own varieties is absolutely possible. I mentioned Brad Gates, the amazing tomato guy. And he is Wild Boar Farms. 
His tomatoes and his tomato story are absolutely incredibly inspiring. He has created a completely new branch of the tomato family where he combined the genes with wild tomato genes. So these are pest resistant, disease resistant, more vigorous and more versatile than any other tomatoes I've ever worked with. And that's what everyone's saying. It's absolutely, absolutely incredible. So check out Wild Boar Farms. And then this is one of my things. This is something that I did. I was the first person to adapt Piscarantu and Cayochuspi corn to North America. These two corns were considered impossible to grow in North America because they're daylight sensitive. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't get enough light to match their pollination um, with their, their ears going out. So the tassels wouldn't match the, pollen, the pollination. And so you wouldn't have successful um, pollination of the kernels. And so I figured it out. And it was because I applied permaculture principles. And uh, it's actually, it's, there's, it's even in a book. Um, what I did is now published in Stephen Smith's new book, Roots, Shoots, and Moccasin um, Boots. And... It, 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 I basically just just made it so that it got less light, of course, but I planted it in such a way that it would imitate its home in Peru. And uh, yeah, I can get more than that in a later talk, but people are really worried, not just about seeds, right? Seeds, seed diversity, seed sovereignty is very important, but people are worried about animals, and rightly so. Um, we're in the middle of the sixth great mass extinction is what many scientists are saying. And if you look at the numbers, uh, land mammals by weight, humans are the center, and then our cattle and our food animals are the gray, and then the little green dots are the wild animals, and there aren't very many of those. So when we hunt, um, though the hunters are often the, the greatest stewards and advocates for wildlife in America, um, and most areas, they're the ones funding and keeping areas wild. There's not that many wild animals left. So we need to ha partner with these hunters and then give them huge amounts of land <laughs> to keep pristine and then to monitor and then selectively act as the predators, be the hunters. But just like with the ocean, act as the, the, the hunters would. Be, go, go with an awareness. Don't go and kill everything. Don't go and overhunt. Don't go and underhunt either. But like, let's figure this out and get the rhythm and the, the thing right. Because we all know underhunting causes things like Lyme disease to go like crazy. But overhunting causes its own set of problems um, as we've seen everywhere. I mean, I mean climate change is, is, is the silent hunter killing off so many of our, of our species right now. All right, so um, humans and the extinction crisis. People are like, oh, humans are the cause for all the extinction, but, but look, we are for the past 200 years, and we have specific things that we've removed from, you know what I mean, from the biosphere, but not that much. I mean, most of, most of the animals that have, have become extinct is due to climate change, and they just didn't adapt. And so I do not think that we are, by definition, humans are linked to extinction. I think that we can be the most powerful force for regeneration on the planet. So we need to provide habitat for animals. So we need to have monarch way stations. We need to have areas that draw on pollinators. We need to have areas that support the birds. We need to have areas that support our snakes and our lizards. Everything is important. We need to rewild as much as possible. So this character right here is the mastodon. It's really important to understand that the mastodon was the annual to perennial cycling mechanism. So they went in and ate small trees, knocked trees over, disturbed an area. And in its wake, weeds would grow up or annuals would grow up. They'd repair the land and then you'd have the perennials move back in. 
and heal it and become forest again. We humans followed these mastodons around, collecting the seeds, got to know these mastodons pretty well, we started drawing pictures of them, we started hunting them because we got to know them so well that we figured out how we could hunt and eat them instead of just falling behind them and eating in their wake. And then when they died off, whether it's through hunting or whether it was the climate change at the end of the last ice age, and guess what? I think it was both. Because think about it. Climate change causes stress. What happens to a stressed plant or animal in nature or in your garden? Something comes to eat it, right? We ate the mastodons because they were stressed. And so we had to take over their chore and the service they did. So we started becoming the annual to perennial mechanism. And at first that was fire. Then it became tillage. And we, we, we are still doing it to this day. So we have to understand that to rewild, we need to bring back big animals. We need to bring back predators. We need to embody the wildness that needs to be expressed in that area if we don't have that animal in that area. We need to be it. We need to go wild. <laughs> so step five, rewilding human culture, right? <laughs> rewilding does not equal chaos, okay? Rewilding equals biomimicry. And it's working with nature that is permaculture. So that's what we see. We see these sites that, you know, beautiful sites, they work with nature. We want permanent cultures out of these things. But most people are like, yeah, I get gardening and homesteading, but you know, how does it apply to everything else? Because you, you got me with the ecological, but what about the economic and the social? Most people get caught up right here. Um, and the reality is we need to discuss the, the realities of our world. Everything exists as part of the solar economy. You know, the light we get in a day, the light we get in a year is really the energy we get. And anything in excess from that is borrowed from another year. Even fossil fuels are just borrowed sunlight from another time period. So polyphase farms, you know, they're grass culture farm. They focus on the grass as the photosynthetic point of contact. And that's, and their product is beef and chicken and eggs and all these different things. But the quality of the grass determines everything else. Algae culture. This is what Veta La Palma was all about. If their algae supported a healthy uh, fish, then the fish supported healthy birds. And if the birds looked healthy, then the system was operating well. They focused on the photosynthetic point of contact. Now, the seed economy. Now, this is a concept I've talked about. Seeds were once the currency of the past. When we started collecting seeds, we got so many that we started trading them, we started using them as value, we started experimenting with them. I mean, this is where like bread came from, right? Someone that was making paste out of their, they were mashing their, their seeds and making this porridge. It was amazing. But they had so much of it one time that they didn't eat it. And they found it and they're like, oh man, it's all funky. It's all bubbly with wild yeasts. And they're like, you're gonna eat it. No, I don't wanna eat it. Fine, I'll cook it and then you'll eat it. And they cooked it and it rose. And that was the first sourdough. And then when they, made, when they made so much juice that they had too much juice, it fermented. Came all fizzy and bubbly and they were like the first soda and then they had so much of that that they didn't drink it all the first day and then it got more alcoholic and they're like wait this stuff's changing you know and and then maybe later on they figure out how to bottle and that's when they get the secondary ferment and real alcohol began so this abundance is the foundation nature and abundance is the foundation for everything our creativity our free time our expression reflection Everything comes out of the abundance of nature. So seeds were the original currency, I feel like. And they're also the currency of the future. So the economy of the dollar, you know, we work for the dollar and we spend that dollar on food. That's the way our system currently works. But when I think of my son, what does it look like for him? Well, there's these things that are going on right now that he's inheriting. There's less jobs. They're less reliable. It's for less money. There's more inflation and more hours working. Ugh, that's not good. And then there's crop failures. 
there's foodborne illnesses, the nutrition is dropping, and the prices are rising. This is an awful situation for my son to inherit. So ideally, you'd want to work less and spend less. But that's kind of controversial because you're shrinking the economy. But that would make me happy. That would make me actually more powerful in my own life. That would give me more freedom. So there's like in a freedom economy and then there's the dollar economy, which is the opposite of freedom. So if we really want more freedom, then we want to work for that money and then invest it into a new economy, the seed economy, where you're going to be growing your food, you're going to be saving seed, you're going to be breeding animals, you're going to be making your own food, you're going to be you know, preserving your own food, you're going to be trading, bartering. So what's going to happen is an exponential growth of food, seed, health, and money or value. And all those lead to greater independence and freedom. And then when people have greater independence and freedom and the economy of the dollar is minimized and instead this local economy that supports families grows, the seed economy, we have food stability. We have peace and prosperity. All these conflicts that we see all over the world, look at their natural world around them. Is it abundant? The areas where these conflicts are, it is not abundant. These are areas of scarcity. And so we need to understand that if we promote these natural economies, we will see a return to stability, a return of wealth, and a, re a resolution of all these conflicts. An economy of infinite growth and potential is possible, but it's only through permaculture and things like the seed economy. So local businesses also can work this way because it's just basically decentralization, which is really localization. It's not that scary word. It's really just localization, the return of community. That means farmers. Who, you know, and what do these farmers represent? Well, they represent freedom, self-reliance, independence, entrepreneurism. And if we didn't have these things as part of the foundation of America, it would have never broken away from Britain. It would have never become an independent co colony and inspired so many other colonies all over the world to break free from imperialism. Let's look at some examples from leaders in the regenerative economy. The Fiber Shed. This is an incredible organization that helps people create a closed loop fiber shed system from soil to soil in local bioregions. Guayaki, which helps people regenerate the South American rainforest with every cup of mate they drink. We have people like AMA CBD, Antoinette Marquez, who are using regenerative products from the ocean to provide therapeutic thalassotherapy medicinal and therapeutic beauty products. Absolutely incredible. We have people like Dan Halsey of PRI USA of Southwoods Ecosystems. He's showing us what professional design can really look like. The sous chef, Sean Sherman, is showcasing North American indigenous food systems and how you can turn them into gourmet dishes that delight them out and are amazingly healthful and regenerative. Golden Coast Meads, Frank Goldbeck, is showing us how we can create a regenerative honey and mead system that people can drink regeneration and heal the environment with every glass they drink. And then there's folks like the Regenerative Enterprise Institute or Terragenesis International, and they're coming up with ideas like the eight forms of capital so that people can really understand how we can move on past the economy of the dollar. All right, so social. How does social work? Well, it all boils down to community building and then self-care. It's sharing, bartering, selling, resources, services, and information locally. So that's seed libraries and local companies, tool libraries and local tool builders, homeschool groups, local schools and apprenticeships, local libraries and book clubs, repair clubs and repair shops. It's also communal activities and places, so you're creating communal memories. Community gardens and seed and scoring swaps, community parks and centers, farmers markets, street fairs, holiday celebrations and parties of all kinds. 
Land trusts can like range in their function, whether they're trying to just protect the land for conservation, or there has to say in a very specific function for a family. It's all determined on how you design it. Land trusts are very interesting. They're designed to take the land out of the market and preserve it for a specific purpose. And then we have intentional communities. These are communities that have a very specific purpose that everyone agrees to participate in and preserve. These could be like monasteries or universities or eco-villages. Things like sociocracy are being used to help gain universal consent in these kind of situations. They build towards unanimous consent using self-organizing systems. Things like holacracy are also being used for people who don't like consensus because it puts roles and goals ahead of consensus using self-organized systems and has a defined constitution. And so those roles, they become tantamount. And when you're obeying your role, you're actually helping the company. It, it's really a lot less complicated than it sounds. You should check it out. Holacracy One is doing excellent work. All right, and then nonviolent communication. Marshall Rosenberg's uh, work, absolutely incredible stuff. The four components, observation. You observe without having an opinion or a judgment or uh, criticism. And then you share how it makes you feel and, and you just say, I observe this is happening and this is how it makes me feel. And then you share your needs. I have a need to go to bed by nine o'clock because I'm waking up at six. So I request that we all turn down and be quiet for the night and we go to bed. <laughs> and then a restorative circle. This is kind of like nonviolent communication in an organized framework part of restorative justice. This is really neat. This really helps people hear both sides and arrive at an actionable, uh, an action that's, that's acceptable by both sides. So we need to explore these tools more to know how to use them um, in, in multiple contexts. They are not society-wide. We need to bring these to the floor and then expand them and complicate them, or maybe even simplify them. So decentralization. The world is way too complex for centralization to work. We're seeing a breakdown of things that are the pillars of our society in a civilization. Public education, large corporations, large governments, large energy grids, global food systems, scarcity economies, allopathic medicine, and so much more. And the reality is they're all monocultures. And monocultures are totalitarian in behavior because they want simplicity. They want to dictate things. So they want full control. And so they simplify things so they can get that control. But when something goes wrong, it spreads just as fast as their dictation, right? So they want easy control. But when it flips out, when they lose control, it goes south really fast. So ignorance, viruses, disease, racism, violence, fear, distrust, environmental collapse, extinction. They travel fast. Uh, this is a picture of Detroit. This just shows you uh, when you have a monoculture, like, you know, it's Motor City, right? It's based entirely on the car industry and it failed because of that. The potato famine. They had 10,000 potatoes to choose from. They chose one. Oh, it just drives me nuts. They chose one potato instead of choosing 20 potatoes to grow. And so when the potato famine hit, it destroyed these, these potatoes and it was a monoculture, so it became a feasting ground for that blight, for that fungi. Nature is diverse and complex, and it creates a unique balance, and we need that diversity for stability. So how do we do that? Huh. We do the five steps. And we do it through education. So that's why I wrote the Permaculture Student Series. That's why I teach all the, you know, the soil science. That's why I teach you about forests. That's why all, you know, all these pictures are pictures from my actual books, the Permaculture Student Series. And this is why I teach you my courses. And uh, that's why I'm creating more books like The Forgotten Food Forest. That's why I have gardening courses. That's why I have Permaculture Student Online. And then we got to do it by example. So that's why, you know, I do it with my boys. We go out there, we dig, I do it myself. I've made it happen in my own life. And this, I made things that were impossible possible. And that's what we have to do to convince those neighbors that like think you're crazy. You have to show them that crazy like a fox. And they're going to be like, what? And you're going to have them listening to you in that moment. And that's when you say, 
you know, the, the good stuff. You don't put your foot in your mouth at that moment, okay? So, so um, Grant Schultz is also doing it. Um, people are going big right now and showing us by example what's possible. We have Masanubu Fukuoka's example. We have all these other great people's example. And then by experience, we have to invite people to come over, taste this, bring them a basket, let them actually be part of the dig, part of you know the harvest, part of that dinner. So it may be awkward at first, but there's great reward in having them participate, whether they're children, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers. There's so much to be had by teaching them, teaching your children about what can happen in the garden, in the forest, in the soil. Because the future starts right now. <laughs> because behaviorally challenging kids are challenging because they're lacking the skills to not be challenging. So those people that you disagree with realize they just don't have the information, insight, or skills that you have. That they don't see the picture that you have. When they get told that they are the root of all evil, that they are the reason that climate change has happened, that they need to stop living, that we need to reduce population, when they get told that they just shut right down. Instead, we need to inspire them, tell them the story, the truth. When we have these five steps, we can change this world into an abundant world that's beyond our imaginations. We don't know what's possible. We know that we can fix all the problems we've created. We know that we do not have a problem that's unfixable. But we have to follow these five steps. We have to embrace them as part of our culture and become them, make them part of our economies. We get to start the conversation. So share these five steps, start the transition and check out the Advanced Permaculture Student Online. I have a course that's gonna help everyone actually do this, help everyone actually learn from the experts on how to make this their business, how to make this part of their life, how to make it simple and understandable. Let's get that education that you never got in high school. Let's get it now so that we can live a more abundant life today. So I have partnered with over 35 different teachers, organizations that are going to help me teach this that are going to help reskill our world so that we can have that amazing future that we know is possible. So right now I wanna give you a gift. If you go to my website, thepermaculturestudent.com and just start scrolling down, you'll notice that there are free books to be had. The Permaculture Student 1 and The Permaculture Student 2 are free right now. I want you to go there right now. I want you to Go and click on those things, enter your email address, join the, the videos, get the, get the ebooks, and start studying because the answers are there. They're waiting for us and they're absolutely inspiring, hopeful, and get you feeling connected to this future, this abundance that is just waiting for you. So go check that out now because there is hope in regeneration. I'm Matt Powers. Thank you so much. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. See you next time.